Thank you. Um, it's great to be here. Uh, so personal mobility is a major part of the fabric of American life. Our ability to easily get around in a car uh, and to cheaply and quickly refuel that car with gasoline has historically been a measure of our independence. But as more Americans move to cities and as technological advancements make alternative, alternative fuels more appealing to mainstream consumers, that paradigm is shifting. So we have two excellent speakers that are helping to redefine what personal mobility looks like in order to create cleaner and less congested communities. So first, we're going to hear from Rich Feldman. Rich is the Northwest Business Development Manager for Proterra, which is a company that manufactures battery electric buses. Prior to Proterra, Rich was with Ecotality and also the mayor's office at the city of Seattle. He has a lot of experience in electric vehicle policy and program development. Uh, he's worked on a large U.S. Department of Energy project uh, in the Pacific Northwest, negotiating hundreds of charging station contracts. Uh, and I've also worked with him um, on policy related to advising uh, utilities on electric vehicles. Um, so take it away, Rich. Great, thanks so much, and uh, uh, really a pleasure to be here. Uh, I'm with Proterra. Uh, we make battery electric transit buses, and we will eliminate diesel and bus transit. So part of this is looking at this ability to go to scale in a sector and understanding that it's just a serious effort. There's serious money behind it. It's viable. And so I'm speaking very much from a business perspective of how we bring the resources to bear and the innovations that are happening and cost reductions in battery technology. That's the other big takeaway that I hope you uh, come from this is just people are familiar with the radical reductions in costs for things like solar. There's equally radical reductions in costs in battery technology, and it has fundamental implications, not just for transportation, but uh, for the uh, utility sector as well. <clears throat> so our mission is to eliminate uh, diesel from bus transit by delivering uh, excellent products using electric vehicle technology, superior uh, bus technology than what the industry currently uses. Founded in 2004, um, we've got offices in California Southern, and South Carolina, new manufacturing setting up in South Carolina, battery manufacturing in Burlingame, uh, California. Growing, 200 employees. We've, we're now on uh, Series E. We just raised $140 million in January. And that, in terms of uh, viability of the, of the company, uh, that last on Series D was $30 million. So Series E is typically the last series before IPO. So in terms of bringing investment capital to this effort, again, there's a level of seriousness, seriousness and commitment to truly eliminate diesel from bus transit. <clears throat> We've delivered over 100 uh, vehicles to various agencies across the country, 3 million miles of revenue service carrying passengers every day and displacing diesel uh, with significant um, greenhouse gas reductions. <clears throat> The, the bus industry is, comes under Buy America, and so we, all, our buses are made in America, high content, uh, creating jobs in the U.S. Lots of customers, both commercial, university, uh, conventional uh, bus transit across 20 different states, coast to coast, uh, blue states, green states, purple states, um, they're all seeing the benefits of going uh, EV. We haven't had one customer that started off with a small fleet that said, no, nah, we're not going to do that anymore. They're all repeating orders. 
they're all seeing the benefit, and I'll go into more of that. <clears throat> so this is a purpose-built vehicle. It's not taking batteries and jamming them into a metal frame bus. Composite body. The um, tooling for our bodies are actually made down the road at Janicky, um, uh that makes also tooling for Boeing composite bodies, so similar kind of technology. Uh, lightweight vehicle uh, will come in lighter weight than a diesel or diesel hybrid, even with the battery pack. <clears throat> and then, as I said, purpose-built. So when you see purpose-built EVs, you have this big volume of batteries underneath the bus, and this is uh, flexible, so we can, not in a kind of overnight thing, but you can sub out batteries or as chemistries evolve or technology changes. This is a platform, so it will um, be viable as we know battery technology and density increases. So just, you know, back on kind of some of the prior comments, just one basic fact is electric motors far, far more efficient than internal combustion engines. And you're seeing that same lack of efficiency whether you're burning biofuel or gasoline. Just think about it, when you fill up a car with 10 gallons of gas, maybe two to two and a half is actually moving you down the road. The rest is waste, heat, et cetera. Electric motor, you've got magnetic fields, you don't have the friction. This is top is a typical bus uh, engine and below is the UQM the motor we use in our buses. One of the aspects of the bus industry is it's kind of like the uh, razor blades, they sell you the bus and then they make all their money on the consumables. And uh, internal combustion engines consume a lot of parts. There are thousands more parts than an electric vehicle. So that's part of the economics of electric vehicles. It's not just saving diesel, it's much lower maintenance costs. I don't know if the person from the LEAF is here, but any, any electric vehicle owner knows that they have a lot lower maintenance costs because there's not all that moving stuff. It's not everything you've got to consume. <clears throat> so just briefly, when we talk about battery technology, it's lithium ion is a family of chemistries, and battery engineers design those chemistries for different applications. So similarly, in our, in our situation, we have buses that go short distance, and we want to charge them up really fast. That's a different chemistry than a bus that goes a long distance and uh, will charge up overnight. So just, there's uh, electrical engineers. <laughs> They've got a good, good thing in terms of what's happening here in terms of understanding this technology and how it gets implemented. But we're entering into this new era. So uh, large battery uh, vehicles, the big battery era is fundamentally different than what's happened before and has, has significant implications about uh, how batteries, uh, uh, dur their durability and charge cycles. It's a, it's a different sequence than just a couple years ago. I can go into more. Our buses are able to overhead charge and get a very fast charge, uh, 400 kW. They also can plug in just like using the same plug that a Chevy Bolt EV or a VW uses and charge up at the overnight at the, uh, at the uh, uh, bus yard. And again, there's different chemistries that are gonna have different characteristics in terms of how hard a charge you can put, how powerful a charge you can put in and versus kind of their range. So this, this is kind of showing kind of the trend in technology. We, the FC, the fast charge bus at 79 or 105 kilowatt hour nominal is what we've been running mainly. This era of big batteries and having that big under, under compartment uh, ability, 440 kilowatt hour, it's just a huge difference. If you can just do some math, you know, two and, two and a half, three kilowatt hours per mile in terms of what your nominal mileage on, on something like this is. Um, that's not all available, but we took one of these buses, an E2, the 440 kilowatt hour, and on a test track, you know, so an engineered kind of situation, regular speed, no hills, over 600 miles. That's a bus, 600 miles electric on one charge. It's just kind of an indicator of this really dramatic change in the battery technology that I kind of, kind of introduced. So we beat uh, diesel and diesel hybrid on what fleet owners need to kind of look at. Tailpipe emissions, noise reduction, 
fuel economy, our bus gets 22 miles per gallon equivalent. There's probably folks in this room that are driving vehicles, <laughs> passenger cars that are getting less than that. This is a bus uh, that gets 22 miles per gallon equivalent. And then a, a bus is a 12-year asset, um, something to come back to. So if you look at the lifetime costs of that vehicle just on fuel, you have a reduction. Um, looking at people projecting 12 years out of what fuel costs are going to be. Um, and King County Metro is run, has been running a fleet of three of these since uh, last year. Uh, they just announced the largest order of EV buses in North American history at 73 and then a commitment to go further in that. I think, and there's some good policy aspects that Vlad, I think, is going to touch on in his talk. But um, just in terms of the influence of a top five transit agency, which Metro has, and that signaling, like, this is a real thing, it changes the conversations with our parts and vendors, the people that wouldn't really talk to us necessarily, that are making uh, large numbers of components for our competitors, are now saying, well, let's, okay, let's talk. And that's part of the process if you scale up, drives down costs. <clears throat> so you can go to uh, energy.patera.com slash KCM and um, see at this moment what, those, what that fleet is doing. So far it's uh, over 100,000 miles, three buses in kind of a test mode, carrying passengers and comparing it to a diesel hybrid which does six miles per gallon or 6.2 miles per gallon. Um, uh, we've got a lot, a lot of opportunity to reduce diesel uh, every time one of these buses runs. So these are actual buses actually running, carrying passengers, and that's uh, across the country. You see a number of agencies doing the same thing. So what's that driving that battery costs with scale, with the, you know, the increase in EVs in terms of numbers, that's brought down the cost of uh, per kilowatt hour in terms of what we pay for our, our battery technology. You're not seeing that in our competitors. Their, their technologies are not coming dropping in price. Ours are. We're already beating over our lifetime cycle costs uh, looking at diesel or diesel hybrid. But that, that, that curve is continuing to, to plummet. And um, Dustin Grace, who came over from Tesla, who was the director of a battery engineering, his comment is, everything you read in the internet about cost per kilowatt hour is totally wrong. It's way exaggerated. I mean, the stuff that we're seeing um, for costs are pretty eye-popping. So this is something that continues, that continues with scale. And this is just a um, presentation that was done for the uh, California Energy Commission. But this is something that has happened again and again in technology. It's predictable. It's knowable. It was a great. Uh, professor out of MIT and Stanford, Tony Siba, that does a great talk on disruption. But this type of curve, which is based on learning of the manufacturer, cost reductions, it's predictable. So this comment about, will this happen? Is this going to happen? This is, this is knowable. <laughs> We're hitting that. We hit that point. Diesel could be zero. And because of the maintenance costs, we will beat diesel, diesel hybrid. Diesel can be zero at this point. So in terms of from a fleet perspective. Um, so this is the, the cycle that's happening. So it's this virtuous cycle of energy storage, which goes across and opens up new markets. EVs made possible, transit buses, as the scale increased, as the cost reduced, that opens new markets and makes your EV bikes possible, energy storage possible, and it's going to continue to kind of accelerate once it keeps going. And what is going on? So just in terms of fleets and fleet owners, they've gone from test vehicles, test fleets, to commitments. So this is from in Foot Foothill Transit's boardroom. This is every board meeting. They look at this um, target that they've set, all electric by 2030. They have a fleet of about, uh, I want to say, 350 buses. And so what that means in terms of policy, and, and we'll get into this more, they need to stop buying fossil fuel vehicles now. 
because that's a 12-year, you know, commitment. And that's, that's the path that they're on. That's what it means. And it's that kind of focus that we've seen and more of that happening with agencies across the country saying we are going to go all electric by X date. So that is a short bit from Proterra. Our next speaker is Jessica Finn Coven, and she is the director of the Office of Sustainability and Environment with the City of Seattle. Uh, the Office of Sustainability and Environment collaborates with a wide range of stakeholders to develop innovative environmental solutions that foster equitable, vi vibrant communities and shared prosperity. Uh, prior to that role, Jessica was the Washington State Director for Climate Solutions and she has also had roles uh, with Greenpeace, both in Washington, D.C. and in China. Thank you, Jessica. I'm shorter than everyone else. Hi, thanks for having me. It is really fun to be here and really exciting to see so many students here. Uh, it has been a while since I have been a student, but not that long. And so the idea that there's a bunch of students who wanna spend the day at something called an energy symposium makes me really excited and makes me feel like I'm amongst my people. And I will also say really exciting to see so many young women students here. I, I have a master's degree in energy policy and I was one of three women in my program. And again, that was a while ago, but not that long ago. So really, really happy to be here with all of you and especially the young women who are part of the uh, studies here at Western. So I am here to tell you that cities, I think, are the secret weapon in the fight against climate change. We get to do so many things and pilot so many things in the city of Seattle that I think that we are pioneering solutions that we can all move forward in. And I'm excited to tell you a little bit about what we're doing around transportation electrification. So first, a little bit of context for Seattle. We have a goal to be carbon neutral by 2050. It's been adopted by our city council. We have been directed to do it. I have been instructed as the director of our environment office to figure out how we will be uh, carbon neutral by 2050. We also have, uh, have an emissions portfolio where about two-thirds of our carbon pollution comes from the transportation sector. So we obviously need rapid, massive, transformational change in our transportation sector if we're going to get there. Thankfully, in addition in Seattle, we have a carbon-neutral, municipally-owned electric utility, Seattle City Light. So we obviously need to figure out ways to connect city lights, carbon neutral electricity with our most polluting transportation sector to figure out how we'll become carbon neutral. We know EVs are growing. I'm sure you guys have heard about that. We also know that Seattle is the seventh largest market uh, for electric vehicles of major US cities. And that this has done, been done with uh, fairly uh, limited public incentives. So recognizing this last year, Mayor Murray said to me and his team, we need to figure out the most bold, aggressive path taken by any municipal government to lead on transportation electrification. And he said, Seattle needs to be the city that figures this out. So Mayor Murray launched Drive Clean Seattle last year. And I'll tell you a little bit about what Drive Clean has been up to. But we don't expect it to be the only thing that the city of Seattle does. It's really nested within our broader goals. So as I mentioned, we need to be carbon neutral by 2050. Council has also instructed us, adopted goals, that the city of Seattle should use half the oil that it currently uses by the year 2035. And that to get there by 2030, 30% of the vehicles registered in Seattle should be electric. Drive Clean Seattle is Mayor Murray's plan to start getting us there. 
He wanted to make sure that in the first year of this program, we made some significant progress so that this wasn't just another city plan. We have a lot of climate plans in my office that are very good, but a lot of them have programs we'll be doing in 2030, 2040, 2050. We wanted to say, what could we do in 12 to 18 months so that our residents really saw us taking action? So uh, one of the first things we're doing is just leading by example with our own city fleet. So we have pledged to reduce greenhouse gas emissions in the city fleet by 50% by 2025. This includes things like uh, electrifying 100% of our non-emergency sedans, uh, massive EV purchases, and maybe Brendan will, will talk about it a little bit later, some really heavy work by our utility to make sure that we can charge all of those fleet vehicles. It looks at idle control technology, different vehicle uh, efficiency measures, training our staff on how to drive more efficiently and when you don't need to drive, most importantly. We're also taking work to, to really rapidly expand charging infrastructure. So the mayor announced in his budget last year that in 2017 we would build 20 new DC fast chargers in the city of Seattle. This is more than tripling the number of DC fast chargers that are currently in Seattle. Uh, thankfully, we have the benefit of being joined by Brendan from Seattle City Light, who will be up here, I think, at the next panel. Uh, Seattle City Light really, I think, should be commended for being one of, if not the most forward-thinking utility when it comes to transportation electrification. And Brendan's team under his leadership has just been uh, really extraordinary in how they're looking to problem solve and move us forward in Seattle. Uh, so I will let him talk about those extraordinary programs that he's working on. We also wanted to make sure that when we talk about transportation electrification, we're leading with an equity lens. In the city of Seattle, we're guided by the Race and Social Justice Initiative, which tells all government employees and government offices that we need to work to undo systemic racism in all aspects of government business. So in Seattle, and in, in at my office, the Office of Sustainability and Environment, this means that we're guided by our equity and environment agenda, which was developed by people of color throughout Seattle to tell my office how we can lead on environmental justice. We are uh, advised by an environmental justice committee who reviewed Drive Clean Seattle and really dug into it over a number of several all-day workshops where they talked about vehicle electrification and talked about what does racial equity look like in transportation electrification and what are some ideas that government could embrace to really advance um, equity and social justice in transportation electrification. It's ongoing work, but it's a big body of what we've been doing. And finally, I mentioned uh, in my slide that looked at our first uh, goals for the year that getting policy right and developing the right policies is important. We realize we still have more work to do. That, that's a bulk of uh, the remainder of this year. We want to make sure that we're removing barriers, number one, for folks who want to be looking at, uh, at EVs and signaling to the private sector that we want partnership, that in Seattle we want more friends like Proterra uh, coming in and, and, and partnering with us to tell us from local government how we can get things right. So, uh, you know, our theory is that cities can be the labs of innovation on a whole number of issues, but particularly ways to combat climate change. Uh, I think a lot of the world's best ideas have come from cities and have come from cities right here in Washington State. Uh, we get to think of new things and we get to test them out on the ground uh, in Seattle and in, in other cities on the West Coast. I know in the last panel, Dan mentioned the Pacific Coast Collaborative and that if you look at California, Oregon, and Washington, we make the fifth largest economy in the world. So when we partner together, when we join together and create some new solutions and then share those models to other cities, it, it matters, and it matters on a global scale. So I want to make sure we have plenty of time for questions, so I'll stop there. But again, thanks for having me.
so much, Jessica. I have a few questions for both Jessica and Rich, and then hopefully we'll have enough time to get a few questions from the audience. So, Jessica, my first question is for you. So we know that EVs can dramatically lower fuel costs for drivers and can result in a to total, uh, lower total cost of ownership. Um, Seattle is one of the most congested cities in the country, and it is also a city that has some very vocal citizens and organizations that would like to see the city become more bikeable and walkable. So um, how do we aggressively promote EVs and the fact that they make driving cheaper while at the same time working to make cities more walkable and bikeable and reduce total vehicle miles traveled? It, that is a great question. So in Seattle, your first option should just about always be to not drive. Uh, if you don't have to drive, it's probably going to take you longer to drive. So we are most focused in the city of Seattle uh, in providing a whole range of transportation choices for people and how they get around. I know for me, from my neighborhood to get downtown to my work, taking the bus takes about half the time. And that's because of things like express buses and bus only lanes and I don't have to sit around waiting in traffic. So we say, if you don't need to drive, hopefully we're offering you choices where you don't have to. But if you do need to drive, it should be an electric vehicle. Uh, and in cases where you do need to drive, we want to make sure that we're creating the framework that allows people to have electric vehicles, that we have the infrastructure right, that we have the incentives right, that we're doing everything possible to allow people to choose EVs. But it is certainly not an alternative to investing in uh, our bicycle infrastructure, our pedestrian infrastructure, and our really robust transit infrastructure. We need these things. When you have a city that's growing as rapidly as Seattle, you need all these things together to make sure that people can get around in the most convenient way possible. Thank you. Yeah, so Rich, uh, you currently work for Proterra, but I know that in the past you've done a lot of work related to public and workplace charging infrastructure for electric vehicles. Um, so we know that about 80% of electric vehicle charging happens at home. Um, so how important is it for local and county or state governments to invest in public charging infrastructure relative to other efforts that they could engage in? Um. Well, it's, it's a great question, and just as an EV driver, um, there was a big study of electric vehicle use by Idaho National Lab, millions and millions of miles, millions of charging um, instances, and this was of low-range EVs, the first-generation Leafs and Volts, and 85% of the charging stuff was out of home, and uh, a small percentage of the drivers were responsible for all the, you know, away-from-home charging. So, from my mind, um, and you can talk to any dealer, uh, people do not come and look at a vehicle if they have no way to charge it at home. And the idea that publicly available charging, even with a lot of DC fast charging, is scalable for thousands and thousands of residents is, 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 is foolish. And um, right now we have a historic building boom in Seattle um, many of those buildings are, are green priority permanent. When I walk around my neighborhood, so many of them have no conduit to the parking spot. And they have the houses built below the alley and the parking spots above the alley. It's in, it's, the costs are going to be are so much cheaper when you put that under new construction. And so there's immediate policy that, could, that will have a direct impact of whether somebody can get a vehicle, if they can set up their charging station at home. And then there's, you know, utility role that can be there, like on-bill financing for retrofit mm -hmm. because of these, um, some of the things you see in energy efficiency, same stuff, mm -hmm. split incentives and uh, um, issues with who pays, whether it's the building or the individual. Mm -hmm. So I, I firmly believe that the focus on public charging uh, by the public sector, and there is, it needs to be balanced with a focus on uh, all new construction rather <laughs> than charge, charging mm -hmm. capability. I mean, when's the last time anybody here drove to California? I mean, and that's the focus, it's the idea that if you can drive to California, therefore you will buy an electric vehicle. 
if you can't charge at home, you don't get an electric vehicle. Mm -hmm. so. Jessica, do you have anything to add? Here? Well, I was just going to add. Rich knows we're working on these things. They're all good points. I'm not going to sit here and refute, no, we shouldn't work on uh, residential charging or that things like um, making sure new construction is EV ready is important, uh, which is absolutely why it's, those are the things we're digging into right now. Better? All righty. Okay, great. I was just agreeing with Rich and letting him know, don't worry, we're on it. Okay, Rich, another question for you. Um, I know that there's some promising secondary uses for lithium ion batteries once they're no longer useful in vehicles, um, but eventually they're no longer useful in those secondary uh, uses. So what happens when they're no longer useful as energy storage devices? How is Proterra working to take responsibility for the entire life cycle of the batteries that they are producing and selling? Excellent question. So um, first off, our batteries are you know, in weatherproof cases, and they're actually, I don't know, you could go and show a slide, I have a slide of it, but um, they're designed to go immediately into second use and just stack and okay. not have outside storage required. Second use, when a battery gets to 80% of its original capacity, it's not able to do the same route as what the, what the um, agency wants. So after you know, four or five, seven years, they're going to want to switch it out. But that still has a lot of capacity. So those second life uses, utility applications, other applications, working in a bus yard, having a, a storage to reduce peak loads, you can see all those stuff coming. But the battery packs themselves, there's a bunch of both uh, interna international standards about um, making it uh, viable for recycling, so not using potting materials that hold together the electronics mm -hmm. and have it easily separatable. But there's a bunch of steps that have been done um, within that. But this is, this is a good point because it kind of gets raised to this stuff. So um, how many people here have a car? Okay. So in that car is 21 pounds of an incredibly toxic substance, lead, lead batteries. I mean, just a tiny amount uh, will damage a child forever in terms of that stuff. The mining of it's incredibly hazardous. We're not all you know, worried about um, lead, lead battery you know, contamination because there is a whole industry that's set up to take that back, both in terms of how we deposit it but it's, it's, it's an interesting thing when people bring up concerns about lithium ion batteries versus in what millions and millions and millions of ton of, of lead that are out there. So if you had a choice when you replace your car battery and one of them was lead and the other was lithium, which would you choose? Lithium. <laughs> Is there a third option? <laughs> Anything to add to that, Jessica? Mm -hmm. No? Okay. Uh, well, this will be my last question. It's for both of you, and then um, maybe we'll get one or two questions from the audience in. Um, so, and Rich, you, you touched on this, but so in the late 1990s, early 2000s, there was a lot of optimism around electric vehicles, but then all of the major auto manufacturers discontinued their all-electric programs. Will this electric vehicle renaissance be different? Are EVs really here to stay this time? Um, there's definitely, you know, policy plays a role for absolutely, and in terms of reducing costs, and um, thank God for California. I mean, they have, on the heavy duty side, they have very effective programs to provide that subsidy between the conventional bus or heavy vehicle and and the others that allows for scale. So um, we're on that pathway, and I, I don't see it kind of changing dramatically um, in terms of those reductions in costs, which ultimately you know, provides that competitive aspect. Um, but in light duty, I mean, in terms of what, what how you know, auto OEMs approach this relative to CAFE, and, how electric vehicles play into that, that's, that's probably an important thing relative to uh, um, what diversity we see in electric vehicles. So I get to work with cities across the U.S. Uh, frequently, uh, 
politically progressive cities like my own, but, but also cities that are um, much more moderate or cities in red states. And they are all at this point trying to establish the right policy and incentive framework to encourage more electric vehicles and more electrification of the entire transportation sector. Uh, a couple months ago, the city of Seattle joined with LA, San Francisco, and Portland. It started, uh, started with our four cities. And then pretty soon, 20 to 25 other cities from around the US joined together to issue an RFI to auto manufacturers saying, this is, this is the size of our fleet, very detailed information about our fleets. This is the turnover rate. This is when we are going to be looking for all these different types of vehicles. If you build it, we will come. We can aggregate our demand, we can aggregate our purchasing power, and we can tell auto manufacturers what we're looking for in ter terms of getting a lower price point for light duty that already exists, and the fact that we want auto manufacturers to innovate for heavier du duty vehicles that we need uh, in our cities. I think things like that uh, bring me an immense amount of hope because we're all in it together, because it's a national effort and because we're talking about tens of thousands of vehicles. So it's fairly significant that you see so much movement in urban areas around the US, uh, which, which gives me comfort in saying that, that uh, EVs are here to stay. And, and one other aspect, and we'll hear from this, the utilities playing you know, a really significant role, mm -hmm. that's, yeah. that's a big deal. And that's, um, there's aspects of that that are gonna continue. Um, well, I know that Jessica would really like to hear a question from a student or two. Uh, so, do any students? No pressure. <laughs> do Do we have any? Yeah, Alexa. <laughs> hmm. So it is. It is set up to be, the question was about recycling and um, you know, end of life of the lithium ion battery. So it is set up in terms of how it's constructed to be fully recycled, in terms of having the components come apart easy versus having been trashed, and there's some standards for that. So uh, we are working with a, one of the leading um, you know, recyclers in that area. Um, we haven't had to do that yet, uh, so it's expected that uh, will be able to recycle the, back, the, the components of it. The question was about Seattle's equity work, and I'll, I'll talk specifically about our environmental equity work. Uh, so first, let me start by saying that to operationalize equity in our efforts, uh, I, I think a lot of times people don't do it because they're not quite sure what the first step is, right? Or, or folks try, but they're not quite sure uh, how to go about it. So uh, we're quite lucky in Seattle in that years ago, folks developed a racial equity toolkit which is a step-by-step -step guide to really walk you through how to increase racial equity in, in your program office, uh, offerings. Every department in the city of Seattle is required to do four toolkits each year, and then we present on the findings to city council. Actually, my team is presenting to council at this very moment. Um, they are without me today, but uh, so there is accountability to make sure we're going through the toolkit process, and it's very helpful in just saying, you know, step one, step two, step three, this, this is how you can do this work and how you can engage other folks. As I mentioned, we have an environmental justice committee, so 18 folks from around Seattle who each year choose three or four different policy areas in my office to really dig into. And Drive Clean was one of the ones they've done over the last year, where they first spend, you know, a full day kind of getting up to speed on the issue, right? So sharing some um, our technical understanding of EVs and, and vehicle electrification. And then they share their understanding of how things like EVs 
impact them and their communities and what type of um, opportunities could come if we all kind of worked together and thought a little bit differently. So they created an ideas bank for us with a wide range of things to choose from. I mean, everything from looking at um, worker retraining programs for folks who currently work in auto body shops to looking at um, engaging local high school students in art projects for the wraps around our new DC fast chargers to um, uh, you know, more discounted orca cards for folks to ride riches and our uh, battery buses. You know, a wide range of things that then our toolkit, coupled with those ideas, our toolkits kind of provide the accountability for, well, we need to move these forward now. So uh, happy to talk more or, or to provide more answers, uh, but I found those toolkits, which, which folks can get online if they want to do it, it's not just like a city of Seattle thing, uh, are really helpful in making sure that you're asking the right questions and going through the right steps. And, and I think to the uh, issue of diesel emissions and how they disproportionately impact folks, we'll hear about that some more, but that's clear. There's been definitely folks that have looked at policy related to diesel emissions and who is uh, impacted by those, and it's quite you know, socioeconomically different. Yeah, and I mean, absolutely, I'll just add that Race is the number one predictor in the U.S. of whether or not you clean, breathe clean air or drink polluted water. Um, that's no different in the city of Seattle, unfortunately. So we make sure that our neighborhoods that have the highest incidence of air pollution, uh, which are also our neighborhoods of color, uh, should be the first to benefit from um, vehicle electrification. Yeah. Composite, yeah, wood, wood carbon fiber. Um, you know, we're, our, I think our lifespan is, is going to well exceed the industry norm of 12, 14 years. Um, so uh, the, you know, expectation is those, those buses are going to keep, there's not a whole lot that's going to take those buses out in terms of the body and you're going to be able to replace, and this stuff is designed to be able to replace the components. So. We're expecting those buses to go for quite a while in terms of, you know, there is there's an interesting effort and, and the state has been leading on this of uh, in the composite industry and looking at kind of waste from that industry and how it's uh, recycled. And we're actually participating in that effort of figuring out how we can take waste composite materials that's coming from the Boeings of the world and integrate it into the bus. So that's another, another hit on it. But there's a lot of waste in and composite material manufacturing. We have time for one more question. Sure. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, so I have sort of a broader scale question about uh, the, the industry. Um, so we saw in 2013 GM sold more cars in China than they sold in the United States, and we see a growth economically in China and India, um, but we haven't uh, heard anything about what the transportation sector is going to be looking like in those countries. So I was wondering if you could uh, cue us into, are, are we trying to help those countries move into an electric future or is it going to be a gas powered future with more pollution from them while we get off pollution? Well, I'll let Rich maybe talk about the market for buses, which I don't, oh, I, I know a little bit about the city of Shenzhen, which, um, has I, I want they have thousands of battery powered buses it, it's just extraordinary but, but I, I know not very much about that uh, you know I, I work in a US city so so don't know too much about what's happening on city scales around the world um, I, I did have the benefit some time ago I used to ran, run the Greenpeace China climate program in Beijing and what I saw in China was two things that I, I think is still relevant today. One is that air quality issues are so significant that it's a true deep political problem for the Chinese government, which is why they take it very, very seriously. Two is that they are leading in the clean energy economy. Uh, they are developing uh, policy frameworks to reduce carbon emissions. A, a lot of their cities have linked cap and trade programs. The central government has um, declared that they are going to reduce pollution 
and grow their clean energy economy. So my sense is that right now in our national political climate, the U.S. doesn't have to be helping China. Chinese cities do anything. Chinese cities are really leading, and we need to follow them, unfortunately. Uh, I think the best way to do that, from my perspective, uh, from local government, is for us to create models that work. I work with my counterparts in international cities as well through a, a number of um, of organizations that connect climate-focused cities. And when they come up with a good idea, they share it with us and vice versa. And, and I think that's the, the best thing we can be doing right now. Thanks so much. We have to wrap this panel up, but let's give a big round of applause for Jessica.